Welcome to episode two of the A Sun Game Day podcast, the official podcast of A Sun Sports and A Sun Football. I'm Jordan Griffin. I'm joined by William Hall and Mike DeVader. Guys, overwhelming amount of support for our first episode. Glad to be back here. And we got football Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. It's going to be loaded this week. Oh, yeah. Yeah, excited to be back. Like I said, a lot of good feedback on the first episode of the podcast. So I think we got a good thing. So let's keep it going. And obviously, we were excited about the first weekend in week zero last week. Now we got all of our teams in action for the first time this year. Really excited about that. And obviously, episode, episode number two going on right now of our podcast. So let's get it rolling. I think that's a great point. A full slate of A-Sun games. But before we get into anything, we want to wish Walt Wells a speedy recovery. We hope to see him back on the football field as soon as possible. Okay, we had a stacked week with two huge games last week. Jacksonville State getting a gigantic win over Stephen F. Austin. If you didn't listen to the podcast last week, go ahead and do that. We had a lot of in-depth information there. And really, I wouldn't say it's exactly how we saw it happening, but Jacksonville State, what was your main takeaway? I'll go ahead and say mine. I mean, the rushing attack for the Gamecocks was relentless. We were there in person. Boy, that team looked legit. I think that the the rushing attack, the physicality, I mean, before the storm came, the thunderstorm. There the was a storm, storm on the field that cut the game yeah. out, out, off at the fourth quarter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before that storm came, the the the, the boom was coming from from that from that line of, of JSU. They were just yep. they were they were manhandling uh, uh, Stephen F. Austin and, and doing what they had to do to just take control of that game. I mean, thirty five unanswered points. The statement that I was talking about last week that had to be made that I, I think they needed to do, they did it. Well, and I think you could see the experience on the sidelines for Jacksonville State as well because. That point in the uh, second half there when all the scoring was happening, I mean, it was like, bam, eight minutes, four touchdowns, what's up? Right. So, <laughs> I mean, basically, when I was looking at that game, I was looking at the line of scrimmage. Who's going to who's gonna create those opportunities, offensive, defensive line? And Coach Rodriguez, being the old school mentality coach that I thought he was, he really put that on the field, and it really caught – I don't know if it caught them by surprise at Stephen F. Austin, but you could really see how evident it was – tiring them down the entire game and the result is what it was yeah well being there in person again we were standing in the end zone that Jacksonville State was trying to attack in quarter number two and there for a little bit I want to say halfway through there was a blocked field goal and Jacksonville State not in their favor in Stephen F. Austin's favor and I looked over at you and I said this might get out of hand the other way around which the game ended up being 42-17 for Jacksonville State there was a little bit there where I thought Stephen F. Austin had a chance to really step on their throats and end that game. Didn't happen. 35 unanswered points. Yeah. I mean, that is the resilience you want to see from that squad week one. I don't think there could have been a better result for Jacksonville State. No, I don't think there could have been a better result for the A-Sun overall. I right. mean, I think that was a, a solid way to start for us uh, with a win in week zero. So, I mean, that was good. But, yeah, the, definitely that the game just it, it turned. It was looking like it could go uh, Stephen F. Austin's way and then – out of nowhere, just they just took control. And it wasn't just any ordinary win. 42-17 to 17 over the number 10 team ranked in the nation. Yeah. That's something else. Well, and the other thing with the pressure that they put on Stephen F. Austin, when's the last time any of us or anybody around college football has seen Trey Self look like that? I Not mean, for a while. Right when, he mean, was watching, yeah. when he was watching all those scores, he knew he had to put the pressure on himself, and, and he got out of character through an interception down the sideline. That's all she wrote. Well, Jacksonville State wasn't the only team in action last Saturday. We also had Austin P. the first game of the A-Sun in their first game within the A-Sun. Austin P. they fell to Western Kentucky by 11 points. But, guys, this is a team that was in the ball game the entire way. 38-27 to defeat to an FBS opponent, one of the most lethal offenses we were talking about last week for Western Kentucky. This is a team that I think is going to make some noise in the A-Sun. I know it's a loss. I know – they don't probably like to take moral victories. I'm sure Scotty Walden doesn't like to take moral right. victories. I haven't talked to him, but I, that's my best guess just from yeah. his, his judge of character. That's probably what he would say right now. But this is a moral victory. <laughs> I'm going to say it for Austin P. 38 to 27. They looked really good. Beside turnovers, they could have won that game. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the offense is here. With Austin P and that, and that's the thing that, that watching them and seeing what they did that they're, they're going to produce they're going to score some points and we they're knew, gonna, yeah, yeah we knew that yeah, yeah. they're going to they're be a threat I think uh, 
Dre McCray coming out with uh, seven receptions, 90 yards, two touchdowns. I mean, he's going to be somebody you've got to watch out for. Like He is a bad man. Yeah, he so is a bad man. That just solidified that, that first game. And obviously you want, you want to win every game that you play, but Coach Walden definitely going to be proud of his guys. We'll see how they bounce back. But they had themselves in position. If it wasn't for a couple mental errors that hurt themselves to put Western Kentucky in position to take that game, I mean, a pick six doesn't help. But obviously, they played pretty well, given the circumstances with those with those mistakes with week one. Now they say the best improvement of any team is between that first game and that second team. So let's see what Austin P is able to do on the rebound here heading into this next game. And again, one, one last point before we move on to our upcoming games this week. Uh, Western Kentucky is not a slouch at all. Again, an FBS opponent week one. That's a true test. Western Kentucky is a team that had their quarterback. He's the backup for Mac Jones right now in New England. That's how legitimate this program is and how they can put out NFL talent heavy prospects. Okay, looking at the upcoming week, we already talked about it in the open. This is the first full slate. All six teams are going to be in action this weekend. Cannot be more excited for it. We have our game of the week. We'll get to that a little bit later, but let's touch on a few of these games. So we've all picked one game to individually break down. I'm going to kick it to you first, Mike. Jacksonville State versus Davidson. First of all, this game is interesting because they're at home. It's Coach Rodriguez's first home game in his era, especially coming off that big win. I think JSU Stadium, first and foremost, should be rocking for that team, especially after their first performance so far this year. I kind of want to see if the Gamecocks are going to continue to try to control the line of scrimmage and wear the Wildcats down, just like we saw in the opener. So that's very interesting for me. But on the opposite side, the flip of the coin there, Davidson's rushing attack is no joke as well. They were a playoff team last year. They played at Kennesaw State. They're out of the Pioneer Football League, and things kind of fell apart for them early in the 48-21 loss in Georgia. But the Wildcats were 13th in the FCS, 443.6 yards per game. And guess what? They were number one in the nation ahead of North Dakota State with 336.5 yards rushing per outing. Yep. Seventh in the nation in time of possession, 33 16, just over half the game. And guess what? Unsurprisingly, the Wildcats is running back Corey Williams. He was named a Hero Sports Preseason All-American third team with that rushing attack when he led the team with 15 touchdowns with almost 800 yards, averaged just over 71 yards per game. And I think that's a big matchup for these two teams is the line of scrimmage that they both want to try to establish. And I think Jacksonville State, their rushing attack with 285 yards themselves last week. That's going to be a battle of the bigs, and I'm excited to see it. Well, listen, looking at Davidson, if you're not familiar with this team, the Wildcats, they play in the Pioneer League, just like Mike mentioned, also have one of the le most lethal running attacks in the nation as well. This is as good as non-scholarship football gets in the country. This team got the bid last year out of that conference, and they were able to play Kennesaw State again. It didn't go for them that specific game, but they run one of the best triple options you'll see in college football. Coach Scott Abel is going to have this team ready to play. Again, this is one of the best non-scholarship conferences in the nation. Davidson, they're going to come out and play. Jacksonville State is not facing the slouch week one, so I'm very excited to see that matchup. All right, William, you have Eastern Kentucky versus Eastern Michigan. What do you see there? Um, yeah, this is another week. Another FBS opponent on the schedule for a Sun team, um, Eastern Kentucky and Eastern Michigan going at it. It's the first time in 51 years they faced off, so there's no familiarity going on there. Uh, <laughs> that's a long time. Uh, <laughs> and I think we all know about the, the defense, our, our preseason defensive player of the year, Mac Jackson and the EKU defense. We know about that coming in, but I wanted to see what, what we can get from Dakota Allen on the offensive side, mm -hmm. senior bowl watch list. Led the team last year with five touchdowns, 34 passes, 440 yards. Got a catch in, uh, of at least 25 yards in six games. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the Colonel offense can pull out. And, and Eastern Michigan, 78-46-1 in home openers, 44-17-1 when they get to open the season at home. So it's going to be tough for EKU to go on the road and get that win, but – um, it's going to be a good test to see where EKU is this year after having a strong first season in the A-Sun in 2021. Let's see what the Colonels have in 2022. At Eastern Michigan, they're in the MAC. This is a team not exactly like Eastern Kentucky on the offensive side of the ball, but they like to put the ball in the air, averaging two, 262 yards throwing per game. 
We know the historic, again, the NFL talent that they put out the quarterback position with guys like Jimmy Garoppolo and Tony Romo. This team's always going to have a good quarterback. They're always going to put a good product on the field. Eastern Kentucky, this is a huge game for them to start off the year. You beat a team like Eastern Michigan, I could be convinced any team in the A Sun is going to be above 500 this year. I don't know if that's exactly realistic, but man, I think that there is a lot of talent on that Eastern Kentucky team. All right, moving on to the last one. That is mine. North Alabama at Indiana State. Now, I teased, if you keep up with our social media, we teased that there's going to be bold predictions on this one, and that's coming from me this time. And I actually have two, and one's a semi-bold prediction. First of all, North Alabama at Indiana State this week. I think North Alabama is going to win this game by 10 points. I do. I, I think points. I think that I 10 points at the minimum. At the minimum? Yes. Okay. I, I'll get, I, I'm going to get into my reasons here. And again, this is bold prediction time. Yeah. Okay. I am buying in to the North Alabama Lions this year. Coming off a three and eight season, the Lions have held leads in eight of the last 11 games. You had a young team also. They are transitioned into Division One, Not transitioning. Yeah. They now have that ability to finally play for the postseason. And not that that's what hindered them in years past, but that just plays in the back of your mind. I have to assume if you're a coach, if you're a player, you have to have in the back of your mind to say, listen, no matter how, how well we play this year, we're not going to get rewarded for it. So now that you are finally transitioned into Division One, you can get that postseason bid. You can compete to play the best of the best in the FCS playoff. They're returning 38 total lettermen, seven from the offense last season, and they have the best trio. That, that's a, my other bold prediction. They have the best trio of offensive players in the A's Sun. Cortez Hall, Takari Kennebrew, and Corson Swong. Tied in two wide receivers. And if you want to throw in Parker Driggers there, one of the best backs in the A's Sun, I'll gladly have that conversation as well this offense is going to be lethal i think this is an offense that's going to surprise people a lot of returners a lot of experience it's going to come down to quarterback play they have four quarterbacks in that room i don't know who's going to be the starter i don't know if they know who's going to be the starter i, I love this football team talking to corson swan on media day he had one of the i want to say a quote but he had a statement that really stuck out to me that no one else said he's excited for the season just like every other player but He's convinced that they're going to play because they got some dogs. They got That's some dogs. Exactly, he, the one word that just kept coming up, they got some dogs. Uh -huh. And when your tight end is saying that about your team, yeah. that's a great sign. I, I think this team has a lot more talent than people are giving them credit for. They have, a, again, a lot of returning experience. Quarterback play is going to be the key of this season. This offense has the skill players to be successful. I mean, I'm, I'm excited to see North Alabama. Uh, like you said, the, the transition is over. It's behind them. So they've got past that hurdle. They're in the A-Sun. Yep. Let's go. Let's, let's make it happen. Well, we all kind of talked about how excited we were for the offenses. Now, after hearing you talk about that and hearing what some of the players have to say, man, I, my interest is peaked now. I'm, I'm excited to see what North Alabama does and watch out Indiana State, it looks like. Coach Willis is going to have this team ready to play. Okay, talking about Indiana State, why they're going to win this game by at least 10 points. They beat their last Missouri Valley team, North Alabama did. It was back in 2019, but they beat Western Illinois. It's no secret. The Missouri Valley is the cream of the crop in FCS. They're the, they're the SEC of FCS, and it has been that way for a few years. But we'll see if that changes this season. They play the Indiana State Sycamores. They have a chance to face an offense that wasn't too successful last year. They only averaged 15.9 points per game and only in total yards, only 109th in the entire FCS, averaging 287 total yards. That's combined with the ground as well as in the air. I think this is a team that has a chance to go into the house of a Missouri Valley opponent and take one away from them. I think they're going to put up points and I think they're going to hold Indiana State to not a whole lot on the ground and I think that's going to be the key that you can stop the rush of Indiana State which I don't think is going to be a problem with the young front for North Alabama they're going to put some things together and they're going to look great against Indiana State on Thursday minimum 10 point victory minimum 10 point victory I don't want to put pressure on them uh -huh. but I I truly believe I truly believe this hey it's good they're, they're the first game of our slate this week north alabama at indiana state 6 p.m then we have kennesaw state traveling to sanford that's a 7 p.m start all of these times are eastern time as well central arkansas versus number eight missouri state that starts at 8 p.m then friday that's the eku at eastern michigan game at 7 p.m then saturday jacksonville state versus davidson 2 p.m start saturday 
the last game, Austin P versus Presbyterian at 7 p.m. Okay, we've talked about just about every single one of these games. Now let's talk about last week, the players, the individuals that stood out to us. So our players of the week, William, I'll let you introduce those. So yes, getting into our uh, first set of weekly awards for football, we had two teams in action. They split the awards right down the middle, two and two from Jacksonville State and Austin P. All four winners got their first career, a son, player of the week. I mean, obviously we knew that Austin P would do so, but Jacksonville State also had a pair of first-time winners. Zion Webb, their quarterback. He led the offense to that dominant performance at number 10 against number 10, Stephen F. Austin, 219 yards of total offense, career high three rushing touchdowns. I mean, watching him live and in person, he was definitely a, a big part of the reason they took control of that game. And on the defensive side, Deco Wilson, defensive player of the week, led the Gamecocks in tackles against Stephen F. Austin with eight in that victory and got that one interception that they had that also helped Keep the momentum in, in, in the side of the Gamecocks. Special teams player of the week came from Austin P. Maddox Trujillo. Uh, two for two on field goals and a career-long 49-yarder in the season opener. And then we had our freshman of the week. Uh, also from the Govs, Cam Thomas. A pair of punts for 28 yards in the Austin P. opener. Personal best return of 33 yards in that game. And this was obviously his collegiate de debut for Austin P. against the Hilltopper. So they set the tone with our first set of awards and – can't wait to see who takes on the, the, the honors next week. Some comments on these. I think we're going to see a lot of these guys several times this year. Oh, yeah. Cam Thomas from Austin P. He had one of the better punt returns we've seen. Uh, it was the best punt return we saw last week. I yeah. mean, I guess we, there was only one week, so I don't have a lot, whole lot to choose from. Right. But it was a spectacular athletic effort. Even the one that was kicked to him the second time, ball bounced back to him. He's able to switch fields almost twice, able to make something happen. Zion Webb. I mean, again, we were we were standing there on the sideline. We knew it was going to be a run. Yeah. Stephen F. Austin, the crowd knew. The, everyone watching at home knew it was going to be a run. They couldn't stop, they couldn't stop. Webb. Yeah. They could not <laughs> stop Zion, and they could not stop the running attack for Jacksonville State. Deco Wilson, that interception, I think, was key. They already had the momentum at that point right, when right. he got that pick, but it just kept piling on. Yeah. And then that's when games really get out of hand, when you get picks like that from quarterbacks like Trey Self that don't give those up. Yeah. You take those away. I'm going to go ahead and say Maddox Trujillo. Learning from the broadcast against Western Kentucky, they call him Automatix. That's his nickname. Oh, really? At Austin P. I like that. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this, this is one of the best kickers in the A-Sun, undoubtedly. We're going to be seeing him very often on uh, Players of the Week, so I'm not surprised by these. All right, moving on into the next segment. Mike DeVader introduces the standout stat. Loved what you had last week with the red zone scoring touchdown percentage. What do you got this week for us? Okay, so last week for the standout stat, we looked at red zone efficiency scoring touchdowns, but this week we're going to flip the side of the coin and go on the defensive side and look at total rushing defense for our ASEN teams from 2021 and what that can look like as these teams progress through the season. So our teams ranked all six of them between 11th and 105th in the country out of 130 teams. So that's an average of 60.83 on the national level. So that's the number, that's the standout stat that we're looking at to see where we can go as a conference for 2022. So 60.83 on average between all six of our teams on rushing defense. That's about 151 yards per game. And I really want to see, based on our teams' powerful offenses and who wants to control the line of scrimmage, how do our teams do throughout the year versus any style of offense to try to improve on that number from the average of 151 yards per game. So Kennesaw State led the conference now, coming in this year, 105.9. So how close can all six of our teams get to that number because they were 11th? But on average, 60.8, 351 yards per game. What can our teams do this year to kind of make that number go down a little bit? Let's see if our teams can get, on average, inside the top 50 in the country. So Jacksonville State, off to a strong start. Obviously, they gave up only 70 yards on the ground to Stephen F. Austin. And compared to last year, they gave up 158.4, and they were 70th in the country. So changing your number from 70th in the country to 70 yards per game just one game obviously but that's a great start and i want to see what our teams are able to do not only individually but as an average as a conference can we elevate our status listen there's there's nothing worse and nothing better there's nothing better than having a great run defense and making the other team throw the ball 
there's nothing worse than having a bad run defense and watching the team run the ball the entire time. That's again, that, that's kind of what we saw last week. Not being able to stop the run, you get the ball less and your defense just gets more exhausted as the game drones on. So I, I think that's a great stat that you picked. Touched on it earlier, but now it is time to get into our A-Sun game of the week. Coming up next. Welcome back to A Sun Game Day. Jordan Griffith, Mike DeVader, William Hall. This is our A Sun Game of the Week. We talked about it earlier. Central Arkansas versus Missouri State. The reason they this one's picked clearly, Missouri State's one of the best teams in the entire nation, one of the best teams in the Missouri Valley, and that says quite a bit. Looking at anywhere where Missouri State is ranked, any poll you want to look at, anywhere from five to eight. Central Arkansas in their first game of the season, guys. What do we expect to see from this Bears team against one of the top tier elite teams in the country? Oh, I'm looking to see if, if that uh, UCA offense can carry over from last year. I know they they lost a couple of players on the offensive side, but that was th- their biggest thing um, that they had last year was that they're putting up points, they're putting up yards, they're putting the pressure on your defense. So I'm, I'm curious to see if if that carries over with the change they've had on their roster and if they can bring that pressure to the, their first game of the season. And speaking to your point, UCA, they're replacing quarterback Breland Smith, 26 touchdowns last year, and Tyler Hudson, an absolute stud, 1,200 yards, eight touchdowns as a wide receiver. This offense averaged 282 yards in the air per game last year, and they are facing almost an identical tack in Missouri State. Mike, before I get into more about Missouri State, what do you see from UCA this year? I think it's whether or not they can keep up with their offensive pace with the new regime kind of coming in, new players, new transitions, getting everybody used to the offensive style that they bring. Because if you remember last week, Central Arkansas was the best touchdown maker in the red zone that we had in our conference. Uh, 82%, 36 of 44 touchdowns in the red zone. So that's going to be key, especially when you're playing big games and big non-conference opponents. You really got to score those touchdowns. Field goals are going to hurt you. Turnovers are going to hurt you. So obviously the rushing attack and giving the ball to the, one of the best running backs in, in the nation is definitely a good start. But can you score touchdowns in the red zone? That's a huge key. And maybe that might be a bit of a transition, maybe trying to maintain the same offensive output but maybe do it in a bit of a different method. You focus maybe more around Darius Hale this year as opposed to the wide receiving core because you're also replacing your quarterback as well. That's the toughest one to replace. Everyone knows that. We'll see if UCA is able to keep that up. They are a very exciting team to watch. They were last year. I think they're going to carry that over into this year. But once again, they are facing a tough task week one. But iron sharpens iron. This is going to certainly boost their strength of schedule. Missouri State is going to be a team likely i don't want to put too much pressure on them either but they're likely going to be in the fcs playoff no matter what happens this year this is a quality team coached by bobby petrino this is one that puts the ball in the air just like uca and they have one of the best quarterbacks to do it jason shelley 2021 missouri valley offensive player of the year stomped on their single season records last year in passing yards and total offense 3300 passing yards 38 almost 3800 yards of total offense for the Bears and he has returning wide receiver Ty Scott had nearly 1,200 yards last year 66 receptions this is going to be a high scoring battle last time they faced guys this was a 43 to 34 defeat for Central Arkansas but that's a lot closer than I think some people would have imagined it to be playing week one this year both teams also scored 20 points in the fourth quarter last time they faced this is going to be a shootout right yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't see any way why it wouldn't be. That's what we're all expecting to see. And, and I think going in, just with everything you just laid out, everything we've already talked about with UCA, I think the key is the defense. Who's going to come with the defense? I think what, what's going to be what we're looking to see and what can actually make a change. Who's going to come up with that, that big interception or cause yeah. a fumble or that stop them on fourth down when they decide to go for it, just that's those type of things. Who's going to make that one mistake that turns the game on its head? Yep. Yep. Well, I just think that hopefully it's not possible that we're talking about all of this offensive hype. You know how sometimes you say this is going to be such a great game, can't wait to see this, and then watch it's going to be like 6-3 in the fourth quarter because the defenses are dominating. So <laughs> that'd be great if you lo- if you love defense. The defensive-minded coaches are going to love that. But as fans, let's hope not. But, hey, what- whatever works, both these teams are going to try to bring their best effort, and we'll see what happens. Well, the first time they faced off, I believe back in 2013, it was a 17-10 to game. UCA won. They have a good history against 
Missouri State. They are 2-1 and one in the last three. This is going to be the fourth time that they face since September 2020. Not sure how that's possible, but this is a team that's very familiar with Central Arkansas. Well, yeah, and I think that last time they played uh, that 2020 September game you're talking about is the last time they played in, in Conway. So they're one and one at home against Missouri State. So they, they you know, they like you said, they've got good history against them. It's not been one sided either way. So I, I think we're, we're in for a good matchup. Do not miss it. 8 p.m. start Central Arkansas at home versus number eight Missouri State. Moving on to our game within the game. Okay, I went to Mike first on the last segment. I'll go to you first, William, on this one. Um, I think this is kind of piggybacking on the last segment we just had. I think my game within the game is the defense in the Battle of the Bears. Which team is going to show up and, and make that stop with these two high-powered offensive teams? I mean, we've got 34.5 points, uh, points per game last year from UCA. 34.3 points per game last year from Missouri State. So it's offense that we're, that we're looking to see. So what defense is going to make that change? And probably want to be one of those key moments, like you said, that one thing that could happen. Hopefully we don't have that 6-3 fourth quarter game you were talking about, Mike, but <laughs> that one defensive play that could just turn the tide. I, I'm, I'm turning the tide. That's what I'm looking for. And Central Arkansas has the same opportunity that we were talking about Jacksonville State last week. You smack a team in the mouth right when you come out of the gate, the rankings don't matter at that point. Nope. All of a sudden, you see, you look up at the scoreboard, they might have it. Number eight, Missouri State. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Doesn't matter when you're on the field. Right. So Central Arkansas has the opportunity to start their season off better than you could possibly imagine. They're able to get a win. I cannot wait to watch this game and see the results. Mike, what do you got for the game within the game this week? Well, just kind of looking at the feature game that I was looking at on the podcast earlier, Jacksonville State and Davidson. Uh, when kind of go through some of the details of these two teams. It kind of foreshadows its, its own game within the game. The defensive line of Jacksonville State versus the offensive attack, this time on the ground for Davidson. So back-to-back -back week, Jacksonville State has a different challenge in a different way against a good passing offense last week, Stephen F. Austin. Now they're not even going to get close to the quarterback this week. So how are they going to be able to – make that transition to such a powerful rushing attack against Davidson. Obviously, 336 rushing yards per game, leading the country in FCS last year. That's a way different mentality, way different mindset. You're going to get cut a lot on the defensive line. Can you hold up to that? Be mentally strong, stay in your lanes at all times. And what's Jacksonville State going to do against that rushing attack is the biggest key because if the defensive line gets tired or they get out of their lanes, there, there goes Davidson down the field. So it's going to take mental toughness, knowing your assignment, and, and being sound in all aspects of the defense. So if Jacksonville State can control that line of scrimmage again, they'll handle their business on Saturday. And with a triple option offense, if your defensive line is able just to muddy the waters on that front for the entire offense that's operating solely out of the backfield, that is such a big help. I also want to add on to your point, the linebackers, there's a good chance that a JSU linebacker is going to break a record for single game tackles. And I, and I think it's going to be right around 18 to 25. And that's incredible. But that's just what happens with these triple option offenses. These linebackers, you got to go hunting. And you, you're in tandem with the defensive line. Time to go hunt. Jacksonville State versus Davidson. And that's another game you don't want to miss. Okay, my game within the game. We mentioned it as soon as we got on this podcast. Coach Walt Wells will not be with Eastern Kentucky this week as they face Eastern Michigan. I want to see how this team rallies around that. That is a huge loss to have for your week one, your leader coming into this season, a guy that you've trusted and they've recruited you, all of the above. The, the man that Walt Wells is coming into the season, how do you rally with your team, with the coaches that are still there, and be able to get a big win on the road against Eastern Michigan. It's going to be a huge game. It's going to be a huge test to these young men to see if they're able to overcome a big deficit in Walt Wells not being on the sideline. All right, moving on to our A-Sun preview. William, what do you got for us around the conference this week? So looking around the A-Sun outside of football, we just had our second weekend of women's soccer, first weekends of men's soccer and volleyball. Right now we've got 11 undefeated squads across those sports. Five volleyball teams, four men's soccer squads, and two women's soccer teams have yet to taste defeat here in the A-Sun. And also, this weekend, we're getting ready. Cross country gets started. And men's golf, Eastern Kentucky, 
gets the golf season going here in the fall. So we're in full swing. Football, all of our A Sun fall sports are getting going. So it's exciting times. Got to love the fall season. Got to love the fall season. Football, volleyball, soccer, cross country, just like you were talking about, golf starting up as well. We're in the season, guys. Yeah, uh, this is For us, this is the full swing. This is the thick of it right now. I'm so excited to, to watch all of these teams, Austin P and Queens, coming into the conference this year. We've seen them so far and all of the existing teams as well. It's been exciting. Full slate of football games this weekend. Is it? This yeah, is the fall. It's the fall. It's the fall. And, and, and what I'm excited about is, most excited about is, we're getting closer to trophy time. I like the trophy. I like the trophy. I, like I mean, trophy. It's, it's a trophy. It's great. It's not a belt. No, it's not as good as a belt. It's not as good as a belt. No, not even close. Nah. No. No. The belt is supreme to it. I mean, what what's better than a belt? Especially one that spins. Oh, it's going to spin? Well, again, I had to talk to Ted. Okay. I'll right. give him a phone call. I mean, but it, it, if he were to order us a belt, you think it wouldn't spin? It's got to spin. He, you know it would. It would. It would. I might have his face on it, but that's a, that's a sacrifice we're gonna have to make. Uh, hey, I'm all I'm all in. I'm all for it. All we're, in. We're gonna be fighting for that one. If if it's his head spinning on it, it's gonna be an awesome prize. That's what we're looking for. We'll have to we'll have to come up with a name for this too. Yeah, it has to happen now. Uh, There's too this, much momentum at this point. We've talked about it. Like we're just getting it going. It, it's it's almost. It's close to official as you can be if it's on the podcast. Right. Each episode, we just keep building this belt up. Who knows what it'll be by the end of the fall? Who knows? I mean, we added a spinner today. Next week, Mike might add pyrotechnics. It's a true story. (laughs) (laughs) That takes us into the best segment of the podcast, the trivia. All right. Last week, Mike got the point. Um, Uruguay was the the, uh, first what was that? First World Cup ever hosted, I believe. What was it? I forgot. You seem unsure. Well, because you I were forgot. very sure last week when you were going to try to get that point with the wrong answer. Right. But now <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's keep which that same got the energy, first, Jordan. You guys are ta- the okay. first victory in the World Cup. Okay. You know what? I didn't recognize the amount of hostility when it comes to this segment. We just got talking about a, a noted a, a spinning belt with our commissioner's face on it. Ah, okay. We're at another level now, Jordan. Oh, it's like that. All right. It is. It is. All right, we're at another level. Yeah. Well, let's take it to another level because I have a different type of trivia this week. That Last week was easy for you guys. You just had to guess one of the countries. This time, you still have to guess, but you got to fill in the blank here. The trivia for this week, it's illegal to own just one blank in Switzerland. Your choices are A, guinea pig, B, hiking stick, C, broadsword. It is illegal to own just one of... Either a guinea pig, hiking stick, or broadsword in Switzerland. To recap the scoreboard again, Mike won. Me and William are scoreless so far. Thoughts? Beside these blank blank looks at the computer. Illegal to own just one in Switzerland. A sword. It's kind of violent. It is. The the Swiss are known for their violence. That's what that, that that just doesn't fit. So. I would say it's illegal to own a broadsword in Switzerland. Would be if that was the question. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm not, uh, Mike. You won, so you got to pick first. Well, apparently, I don't have the option to defer to the second half on this one since I won last time. But uh, the hiking stick kind of falls into place with the, the mountains that they have, so that's intriguing. <laughs> Guinea pig is outrageous. I, I'm not sure about that at all. <laughs> So it's broadsword. So, sword? <laughs> I mean. Well, here's the thing. It's I, outrageous to own just one of these things and it be illegal. So all these are really outrageous when you think about it. But can you imagine if everybody had a pair of broadswords in Switzerland? <laughs> I just, I don't understand it. Watch that be the answer, but I'm going to say hiking stick B for okay. mine. William. Well. The pressure's on. The pressure's the on. Ch- the, the week one champion has spoken. Yeah. Hiking stick. Now listen, don't let his his answer affect yours, because you want to cover the bases just so I don't get a point. I mean, I definitely it, 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 I, <laughs> the best offense is a good defense. <laughs> so when it comes to you, I, I gotta I gotta I gotta I gotta watch out for you. But what? But here's the thing: if you if you think it's hiking stick and you don't go with it, and he's right, he's up 2-0. That's true. So I'm just saying, if you think hi, hiking stick is right, I'm just saying for future reference for you as well, Mike. Don't let the other person's answer affect you. Otherwise, you'll get a lopsided score before you know it. 
See, what's funny about this is you keep telling us which way to go, and I think you're accidentally uh, going to push us together, so we're fighting against you. You are. We're already fighting you against you. I know, against, but man. we want to win individually, but now it's going to be almost teaming up to make sure that you just don't get one. Okay, you know what? I'm done giving advice. I'm trying to help you guys to help boost your points because now we're, hunt we're hunting Mike. It's on hunt. Yeah, okay. yeah, Mike. Yeah, he's, he's right got, now he's got a hefty one zero lead on us yeah, right now. So it's hefty. That's, that's... Yeah, it was so hefty that I had to go first. Yeah. <laughs> <Are> you complaining? <laughs> heavy is the crown. All right. Well, what you, what's it gonna be? Um, I'm going with the most ridiculous one on the list. The guinea pig. Oh, <laughs> the guinea pig. <laughs> Do you think it's more ridiculous than the guinea pigs or the broadsword? I think the broadsword is probably more ridiculous. But, like, yeah, guinea pigs, like, who who cares? <laughs> like a sword, yeah, a, a guinea pig, like, yeah, that's that, it's it's way more ridiculous. This it's, is wild. Because, I couldn't I couldn't believe what would happen if we actually had four options. What the other one would have been? Well. I might have to get it to four because, Willem, you are right. It are is guinea pig. Yes. Welcome to the leaderboard. I'm still scoreless. Now you wow. guys are tied. It is guinea pig. Um, and I'm just going to give myself some credit. I hate to do it, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and have to for coming up with hiking stick and broadsword. I mean, it just feels like those were good, ridiculous things to put in there. Because hiking stick, listen, you always see people with two, especially the Swiss. They love their hiking sticks, right? Yeah. Broadsword, having two of those. Again, I knew that you know the Swiss are always neutral. They don't, they don't, they don't go into war. That's why the, that's why the sword was like this. Is <laughs> right, and that's that's so out there that you would think, oh, maybe that's true. Like a weapon, like yeah, you gotta have two of these. <laughs> You're not gonna use it, but you better have two of them. Why is it illegal to own just one guinea pig? I'd like to know who the person is that goes into the people's houses and checks. <laughs> <laughs> Mike DeVader, guinea pig inspector, put him up. You're armed with a broadsword. <laughs> <laughs> Two of them, no. <laughs> We've officially gone off the rails on a Sun game day. Well, I, I can't think of a better way to cap it right there. Jordan Griffith, William All, Mike DeVader. This has been A-Sun Game Day, Episode 2 in the books. Make sure to watch A-Sun football this weekend in action. We have a full slate the first time in A-Sun history. We have six teams playing this weekend. Once again, Jordan Griffith, William Hall, Mike DeVader on A-Sun Game Day. We appreciate you listening. We'll see you next week. Peace! <laughs>